This is the grand story of God. Created in the image of God to reflect His character into the world, the relationship between humanity and the Almighty was torn apart by sin. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross brings us back into the relationship for which we were originally designed, for which we were all originally designed. In Christ, there has been a mending of relationships, one that begins with God and then moves outward into all of our relationships. And once that happens, once our unique redemption story begins to take shape, we have the responsibility and the power to flourish and to help others do the same. This is the grand story of God, but we'll need to pause to rethink and to reset. What if God really is writing his story? And what if it involves you? What if it's for the sake of the world? And what if it ultimately reveals the glory of his great name? This is your invitation to experience it, to find yourself in it, and to experience abundant life because of it. Because when that happens, when we find ourselves living in the grand story of God, well, that might just change everything. morning, Grace Church. Good morning. Wow, you guys are awake. We're caffeinating you at an appropriate level these days. I like this. This is great. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Brad. It is a joy for you to be with us. Thanks for joining us uh, again in person or online. It's, it, it's, uh, it's an honor that you're here with us. We are, uh, like uh, Elliot had said, we worship in different ways. We worship through music. We worship through prayer. We worship through an opportunity to focus on giving and stewardship. And now we're going to spend a time worshiping what we call through the word, worshiping through talking about uh, truth of God's scripture. So we're going to be bumping to a bunch of different places. If you've got uh, Bibles on your phones, you can get those queued up. If you would like a paper Bible and you need to bring one with you, there should be uh, one in the seats in front of you. And if by chance you don't have a copy of a Bible for yourself, we want you to take that Bible with you. It's a gift for you. We want everybody to have access to God's Word all the time. So uh, yeah, just be prepared for that. What we're doing now is continuing in this series that we've called Soundtracks, Living Like God's Promises are real, talking about the idea that all of us kind of live according to a soundtrack. And like any TV show that you watch, any movie that you go to, uh, theater, all that stuff, there's always music set to it. And I don't know if you've ever watched some TV shows or movies where they take the soundtrack out of it. It sounds really weird, right? We're accustomed to it and it does set the mood. It gives you cues for what's happening, what you're hearing and what's being played in the background. What we want to talk about is that there are things that we play in the background of our lives that, that affect what's going on, that, that, that affect the direction of our lives. And we, we're saying that the soundtracks that we should be listening to are the promises of God, those things that God has said, this is true and you can count on it. So to start that, we said, what's a promise? That was one of the very first questions we asked. And just because, just because it's written in scripture doesn't mean that it's a, uh, a promise. For instance, there is, I believe it's uh, Leviticus 3.16, right? That's the verse, Michelle, you're going to help me? The fat belongs to the Lord, right? Amen. The fat belongs to the Lord. So this is promised to, to the Lord, right? No, no, no. That's descriptive. It's talking about something that happened. It's not a promise. We have to have understanding of what a promise is. And in, this, in the, the Bible, basically the promises are those things which God says that we can count on to be true for us. And we, we said there's some things we had to remember. First of all, there, there were these different couplets we had to remember, that there are both specific and universal. Specific are, I promise to you individual or you people group, and universal that are for everyone, no matter what. We said that some of the promises are qualified, meaning I will do this if you do this, and others are unconditional, unqualified, they're absolute, which means no matter what, I will do this. And we like uh, the absolute was what we called the Noahic covenant, the promise that God made that he will never again destroy the world by flood, that that will never, ever happen again. And last we said a very important one is to understand the difference between principle and warranty or guarantee or promise. Because so often we'll look at something where it's a principle of scripture, such as, you know, train up a child in the way he should go and he will never, when he's old, he will not depart from it. That's a proverb, right? 
Except how many kids have been trained up well and yet go kind of a funky direction, right? That happens. Why is my son raising his hand? You've gone in a funky direction? <laughs> my goodness. All right. <laughs> well, you just threw it all off. I guess we're going to go home for today, folks. All right. No. <laughs> No, but you understand what I'm saying. You can do it the right way. You can, do, you can follow that principle, but it doesn't always work out. But generally speaking, it will. That's, that's the difference between a principle and a promise. And so one of the things that we started doing was looking at different promises, things that are guaranteed, promised, assured by Scripture, and the freedoms that each of those promises give us. So week one, we looked at the promise of eternal life. We said this was foundational. We said that the promise of eternal life is something that provides freedom from death and from all the, the fears that associate death. We said the, the next week then that we're promised fellowship, both with one another especially as it, as it relates to God's family coming together. But most importantly, most foundationally, that we are promised, even though we had lost it because of sin in our lives, we've been promised fellowship, relationship with the divine, with the almighty God through Jesus Christ. That that is that, that foundational promise that we get, because we can have a relationship with him, we can have deep and intimate relationships with one another as well. That provides freedom from the isolation that is gripping our world. Last week, Pastor Kim walked us through the, uh, the, the idea that we've been promised Jesus' righteousness, that if we accept Jesus for who he is, if we accept his gift of eternal life, we're accepting his righteousness, his right relationship with the Father, and therefore the right behaviors and the way that we live according to that right relationship. And when we do that, when we embrace that, we're freed from sin's power in our lives. That doesn't mean that you're never going to sin again. If I would say, who here never sins anymore, and you raise your hand, you and I are going to have words when we're done here. Because that's what we call a lie. So you just broke it. That's the thing. Sin is still going to be present in our lives, but we are no longer enslaved to its power if we've accepted Christ's righteousness, that right relationship between us and God. These are the first three promises that, we, that we've gone over and those freedoms that it brings. I want us to look at another one. And we have three more weeks of looking at different promises. This week, it's one that I believe has um, great impact for not just what we do, but how we do it and our outlook on life in general. And that's the idea that we've been promised purpose in life. And this is one that's a little bit more subtle and it's promising, meaning God, does, there's, you're not gonna find a verse that says, uh, thus saith the Lord, I promise you purpose. You, you, you don't find it. You put it together from the things, the truths that God has said. And what I believe is one, we, when we embrace the purpose that God has promised us, that we have freedom from emptiness. And I'll tell you, I see emptiness all around me. I see emptiness in the world. I see emptiness amongst my neighbors. I see emptiness within my own family. I see emptiness all around us. And the, the fact is that our world, that humanity scurries to try to fill the emptiness. But the problem is, when you try to fill the void of emptiness with something that, doesn't, that shouldn't go there, it will never fill it. It will dissolve, it will disappear, it will become ineffective. There's only one way to fill the emptiness and that's with the purpose of what God has designed us for. So first of all, we need to understand that that purpose is, is given to us. And that's, that's a rub for some of us, especially in our American culture. We like to think we are 100% self-determined. That I get to say, everything that is true and right and good about myself. I don't like the idea that someone else might say, I've had a hand in making you who you are and, and, and why you're here. So that's a little bit of a hurdle. But if, we're, if we try to step back from that and we look at scripture in the, the, the very first book of the Bible, we have this story, this, this, this kind of poetic expression of God's creation. And in that, in Genesis chapter one, first book of the Bible, first chapter of the first book of the Bible, in verse 28, we'll read this. God Bless them, humanity, uh, Adam and Eve. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And, and, and in that same passage, it says that God created humanity in his own image, meaning that we bear the, the authority, the representation, the characteristics and likeness of the divine, and we're to work it out in this beautiful creation that he's given us. In the very first chapter, the very first book of the Bible, 
we're given purpose. Purpose to, to act out God's beautiful, grand design for this world. That we are to partner in it, not as spectators, not as robots or automatons, but as active, creative partners in what it means to accomplish these things. It's a beautiful picture of purpose. And then if we would skip ahead to the New Testament of our Bibles, where, where Jesus is now walking on the earth and he's t- teaching his disciples, and this comes right before he goes back to heaven, the Son of God returning to the Father in heaven. He says these words, go therefore, some of you might know this, chapter 28 of Matthew, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, obs- er, to observe everything that I have commanded you. There's, there, there's this, this focusing in of what that purpose is, and that's to make those who follow after Jesus. Not again as robots, not as these programmed people or slaves that have no mind, but quite frankly, opening people up to what it means to have a relationship with the divine author of creation. And as a result, when you step into that relationship, living life that brings glory to him because you want to, you're filled with gratitude for who he is and what he is, what he's done, for the beauty and the, and the majesty of him, right? That's the purpose we've been given, to help others know it. Not just to live in it, but to do it, to help others do the same thing, to step into it as well. So when the Bible's talking about purpose, what, what do we have to wrap our brains around? Well, Walter Dunnett in one of those you know, fancy books that I read often, the Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology. Just riveting reading, just wakes you up in the morning, let me tell you. It says this, God has called his people to live a holy life because of what? Do you see what it says there? His own purpose and grace. And that is foundational for us to understand. And it can be, again, that rub. That we like to be self-determining, but the core, the foundation of our purpose is rooted in God's purpose. And it's a grace given before the beginning of time in Christ Jesus, that this was always the plan. God's purpose for us is not, oh shoot, they messed that up. What am I going to do now? Let's try this. That's not what's going on. From before the foundations of the earth, God's design was to invite us into this purpose of imaging him, reflecting him, and spreading his character of love throughout the cosmos. That's the purpose that he's given us. And in fact, um, a pretty smart guy, I never met him myself, but I heard he was super, super smart, said something about what our purpose in life really is. His, his name was uh, Solomon. He wrote a book called Ecclesiastes in the Bible. Okay, And in there he said this, the end of the matter, all has been heard. This is kind of a summation of this book that he wrote. He says, do two things, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. What are we supposed to be about? These things. Now, there's lots of other stuff that falls under kind of those umbrellas of what does it mean. But one that I want to make sure that we don't misinterpret is that first one where he says, fear God. This is not fear like if a clown were to come in the back door and I would run off the stage, stage screaming like a, a small preschool child, right? Although that would be a, a rational response to a clown coming in here, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about things that make you jump or are spooky or, or even things that create terror. This word of fear is the idea of reverence, awe, and respect. It's see God for the glorious, majestic God that he is, and respond appropriately, which flows into the next one, do what he asks you to do. Not because he's there with a hammer ready to smack you on the head, but because he said, look, I love you. Look at all I've done for you. Won't you please come along? He invites. He's the God of the invitation. He invites us to partner with him in his purpose that he has for us. That is the whole duty of humanity, is to is to understand God for who he is and to act accordingly. So I want to give you a few principles. Uh, and th- these are more summations of, as, as you read through scripture, what we learn about what our purpose is and, and, and what the Bible kind of says about that for us in, in, general, uh, in general thought. First of all, what is purpose? It's rooted in God. You have to understand that all throughout the pages of God, or the pages of Scripture, God shares with us that what we're supposed to be about, our reason for being here, finds its root in Him, that He is the foundation. And it's a relational foundation. 
Not just he exists and now we little peons have to serve and do what he wants. He exists, was totally okay by himself, but said, I so want to love and be in relationship with you that I will give you existence and ask you to partner. The idea of us bearing and carrying his image and likeness is that partnership idea. That's the word fellowship. If you look at especially the Greek word koinonia for fellowship, it actually can be translated as partnership. It's why we call uh, what some people, what some churches call members at their church, we call partners for that very reason. It's active participation together. So when we're told that we can have partnership, we can have fellowship with Jesus Christ, it's exactly that. We are in it with him, but it's rooted in who he is. So what is purpose? It always finds its root and its foundation in who God is and what his purpose is. But it also involves my mind, my heart, and my body. And by that, what, we're, what I'm trying to say is it's the whole of who we are. We cannot step into God's purpose for us if it's only this kind of intellectual way of thinking about it. I can't just have agreement with something. I can't just have nice feelings or be really convicted and now I'm partnering in purpose. It can't just be that I, I do a, a list of rules and check marks and get them done, but I did the stuff. Those things cannot be isolated and be fully engaging in the purpose God has for us. It requires all those things, your intellect, your emotions, your volition, and your action. And we'll get back to that last one because that's very important, but it involves all of it. It's not something that you can kind of just stick over there and go about the rest of your life in a different way. It's the whole of the person. And again, here's one that rattles the cage, especially for us in our kind of American, North American uh, thought pattern. My purpose does not need my approval. Meaning, what God says about my purpose, I don't get to say, meh, I don't really think so. If God says, this is what you're supposed to be about, we're supposed to be about that. He's not waiting there to go, well, I really tried to make a compelling case. Think you could get on board? That's not God's approach to it. He says, this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. He gives us the purpose, and we have to say, I trust you because of who you are, because you are good, you are great, you are gracious, you are glorious. So yes, if you say it, I will do it. It's a hard thing for us because we like our independence, right? But the interesting part is, as much as it doesn't require my approval, God's purpose in our life always respects our personhood. You see that also all throughout Scripture, and particularly in places like 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, the New Testaments of our Bible, where Paul is talking about how the church is made up, and you see that there are all different uh, characteristics, that all these different gifts and ways people are wired and how God has put us together as individuals matters. It's not that we're supposed to become these weird, like Xeroxed copies, one of, of the other, where we're all exactly the same. That's not the, the picture. It's a beautiful cornucopia, if I can, of uh, different features and characteristics. Our uh, unique identities are respected by God in his purpose for us. So even though it doesn't require my approval, my who I am is still respected and included in that, and God gloriously, sovereignly interweaves that. He's able to say, I don't need your approval. I don't, you don't get to tell me what it is, but I will completely use who you are and how I've designed you. Those truths work together. They weave together as this purpose is spelled out in our lives. And then lastly, and this is a very important one, our purpose necessitates intentional action. It might be a little wordy or, or mouthful, but I think it's very important for us to understand. We don't accidentally slip into the purpose of God. I can't just go, well, I might get to that at some point. The purpose of God is something that requires me to make a choice, to enact, to employ my volition, and to do something about it. Well wishes towards God's purpose don't give you credit. Well, I thought about doing it, but then I got real busy. Nope, you don't get, you know, intentionality credits if you didn't actually do anything. If you just accidentally do it, God's not there like, oh, that's wonderful. If you didn't do it on purpose, if it's not something you tried to do, you don't get the credit. It has to be something where you say, God, I agree with your purposes, and I'm going to follow after them. This is great. Stratton, do you have a question? 
Yes, you can't cheat your way up with Jesus points. Yes, I'll give you that. It has to be intentional. You have to couple the right intention with the right action. That's how you engage in following the purpose God has for your life. And I'll tell you, people say all the time, you know, I wish I knew what God's will for my life was. I wish I knew what God's purpose for my life was. The the reality is, we probably know in a lot of ways. 99% of the time, we know the direction God wants us to take, but we have to both see it, recognize it, agree with it, and then do it. That's the hard part, because we have lots of good intentions. We just did, uh, and, and, and I'm not about squishing down. I'm not trying to create shame or guilt. Please don't hear that. But I think this was a good example that, that was ringing in my ears. I was talking to someone about our 21 days of prayer. Remember that thing we just did where we said, hey, we're going to take 21 days of prayer and fasting, where we pray for 21 days and throughout that process find opportunities to fast, whether it's a day here, a couple days there. Hey, maybe it's lunch over the, there's all kinds of different ways you could do it, but just include fasting in some way, but spend those 21 days, three weeks in prayer. And we sent out guides each day. I was talking with someone, I was like, oh, how's that going? Because they told me they were doing it. And they said, oh, well, it's going good. But then life got busy about a weekend, so I didn't keep doing it. Now, on one level, I want to encourage, hey, thanks for doing a week. Because a week spent in prayer is good stuff, right? I'm I'm, I'm not poo-pooing that. But we're so easy, so ready to give ourselves excuses to be like, well, I tried, you know. Nope. Following the purpose purpose of God in our lives can be hard, but it's so good for us to do it. Being that it's hard, being that it's good, it's going to take an intentional action to make it happen. So that's, that's where I'm, I'm pushing us. We have to do more than agree intellectually. We have to step into that obedience. Do you remember that old song? I've, I've shared it with you before. It starts with this word trust. How does it go? Anybody know? Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to, there we go. Old song, Overly simple, yes, I know there's other things that have to do with it, happiness, but that core of contentment in life is when we step into believing what God has said and acting accordingly. That's the plan of the purpose of God in our lives. So what does the specific promise of purpose do for us? And I believe if if we do, if we do these things stepping into the purpose, that it, like these other promises, gives us freedoms. The first freedom I'd like to say, uh, and we said it's the freedom from, dis- from emptiness, but what, in what way does it free us from emptiness? First of all, I believe it gives us freedom from the despair of emptiness. As I see people fill, trying to fill emptiness in their lives where things just, again, it's this void within, within themselves. They try to fill it with stuff. What ensues is despair, is depression is this feeling of, why should I even go on, right? This is coupled so often when we don't, when we don't have a true sense of our purpose in life. But I believe if we latch onto the promise of purpose and we, we embrace the purpose that has been promised to us, it counteracts that despair because I no longer have the emptiness. I'm, I've given freedom from it. So I can step out of despair into joy. If we look at Psalm 57, kind of in the, the middle of your Bibles, and in Psalm 57, the first two verses, here's, here's what we read. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to the God most high, to God who does what? fulfills his purpose for me. See, when we embrace the purpose that God has, which is rooted in him, when I am facing the storms of destruction, I have a place to take refuge. Even though everything can be falling down around me, I know that the literal author of eternity loves me and has promised me that eternity with him. All the weight of this world can be removed when I allow him to take it. When I enter into his purpose, he says, uh, follow after me for my, my burden is easy, and, or my yoke is easy, burden is light. Thank you. Told you. Spacehead today. 
That's what Jesus has promised us, right? And if Jesus says that about him, if we embrace that purpose that he has for us, then I have the freedom to step away from the despair of emptiness. I can have that refuge. I don't know about you, but I face some storms of destruction in my life. And I got to tell you, in a very real way, and I've, I've shared some of my uh, uh, struggles I've been having with my back, been seeing some doctors and trying to figure that stuff out. And I've been starting to wrestle in my brain, what if I couldn't move around? What if I was just stuck, I had to sit in a chair or, you know, s- stuck in a bed? And I couldn't do what I do normally. And I started to wrestle with that despair. Because I think it's easy for all of us to slide into my value is connected to what I produce. But I think God knew what he was doing when he set this up as our message series. As I started digging into this, my value is not based upon what I do. My value is based upon the one who loves me and who gives his value to me. And says, no matter what storms are coming, I can take my refuge in him. So my life would look different if for some reason I had a back surgery and I ended up a uh, paraplegic. If that happened, my life would look very different. I couldn't zip back and forth across the stage, right? But maybe I'd make use of the ramp. I don't know. My life would be different, but I would still have purpose because my purpose isn't rooted in what I can produce, but in the one who loves me. That is the massive difference that allows us to have freedom from the despair of emptiness. But it also provides us freedoms from the doldrums of emptiness. Do you know what doldrums is? I love this. Um, uh, it's the, uh, the book, The Phantom Toll Booth. Anybody ever read that? Loved that book. I read that in third grade, and you could go through the doldrums. It was a gray and dreary world where everything was drab, and you were bleh. Well, and that's the thing. Sometimes the emptiness we bear doesn't just take us to a place of despair. We're just bored with life. There's no excitement. There's no passion. It's just I'm putting one foot in front of the next. And that's, again, something that's easy for us to fall into if we're not careful. If we stop keeping our eyes focused on the purpose that God has given to us, the love of Jesus Christ, it's easy to start just going through the motions of life. And that's not what we were designed for. In fact, if we read in 1 Corinthians 5, we've shared these verses a number number of times, but they're so powerful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, we read these words. Rejoice always. Pray always without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the what? Will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I really wish I knew what the will of God was for my life. Well, there you go. Here's the will of God for you. He wants you to be so connected to him, to so see him and value him and cherish him and be affected by his love for you that you can't help but respond by rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances. Excuse me, you don't give thanks in all circumstances because, oh, hey, my back's breaking. I I might have to have surgery. Yay, pain and recovery. I should give, that's not the point. It's in spite of the circumstances, because of the greatness of God and his purpose in my life, I can rejoice. I can give thanks even in the midst of it. It's contentment when everything else is falling apart because I found the single most valuable thing in all of creation. That's how we do it. That's how you step out of the doldrums because your focus is not on the gunk and the emptiness around you. It's on the one who is worthy of of the thanks, the one who is worthy of being prayed to, of having that relational connection to, the one who is worthy of bringing joy again and again, that idea of rejoicing in your life. It's all because of him. When I latch onto him, I can escape the doldrums. I don't have to live in that place of boring, just plodding along through the empty spaces of life. We get freedom from the doldrums of emptiness. We're also promised, by, when we, with the promise of purpose, freedom from the deception of emptiness. You see, the thing is, in this world, we, we do. We try to fill that, those empty spots with what we can. And even if we've seen Jesus for who he is, it's very easy and tempting to pour in other things, to try to kind of mix it in because we're, we're fearful that maybe he doesn't quite fill it all. And it's easy to become deceived and to think that how I need to go about it and my idea for my purpose, that I get to determine it and 
I get to be the, the Lord of my own life, as it were, to, to, to buy into that. And quite frankly, if we read, uh, as we do in Proverbs 19, this truth, many are the plans in the mind of a man, which is the idea of, hey, people come up with a lot of good notions, right? We all know, hey, it's going to do this, I'm going to do that, this is how it should be, you know. We have great plans, all of us, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. As much as we plan, as much as we might like to believe that my way is always valid. And that's one of those tough ones. I was was talking to someone the other day, and you know, the the lie that we tell our kids, you can be anything you want, right? Like for instance, my son who's in the room, if he really, really, really wanted to be a world-class sumo wrestler, he can't. He just does not have the body to do it. He can't, he can't do it. And for me to say, oh, yes, you can, will breed a lot of uh, despair, a lot of uh, disappointment in his life. Now, that, I'm not trying to say we should be smashing kids down and say, you, know, you shouldn't have any dreams or aspirations. I'm not saying that. But when we start thinking that we can crown any of our own plans and ambitions as being of ultimate authority, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. We have to trust that God's purpose is the thing that will last, and I have to look to him to validate what my plans will be, not the other way around. I used to do that all the time. I used to come up with wonderful plans and go, all right, God, now bless my plans. I never said, God, what is your plan for my life? And it took a while as I grew in my faith to switch that and to stop saying, I'm going to just have my, my plan, and God, you'll conform your will to it, but to say, God, what is your will, and how do I follow after it? That's a fundamental different approach to life, but when you can do it, it makes a world of difference. And you're never going to be perfect at it. We're never going to be perfect at any of these things. But the trajectory of our lives needs to be one where we're able to say, God, your purpose is what I want to connect to. That has to be the trajectory. And when we do, we avoid the deception that emptiness brings when I'm left to my own devices. And lastly, I want to suggest that uh, the promise of purpose gives us freedom from the direction of emptiness, where emptiness will ultimately take us. Again, in Proverbs, and it's, it's very interesting, if the Bible says something, if, if, and again, I'm speaking to those who have chosen to follow Jesus, if the Bible says something, would we generally say, if he says it, we should believe it? Is that generally a pretty safe statement? So if the Bible would say exactly the same thing, in two totally different chapters in the Bible, we might say, well, not only does he want us to do it, this must be important. And I think that's true because in Proverbs 14, and then again in Proverbs 16, with exactly the same words, this is what we read. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. When we're left to our own devices we invariably turn towards death in a variety of forms. And the thing is, the way death is defined biblically, scripturally, theologically, is a separation, the the emptiness of relationship, as it were, primarily between ourselves and God. And the thing is, when we are crowning our own thoughts as supreme in our lives, when we're saying, I get to be the arbiter of truth in my own life, And, you know, if if God happens to agree with me, great. If not, I'm not worried about it. That is the way to death. When we understand God's purpose for our life and we embrace it, we move from the path of death and destruction to the path of light and life. That is the radical difference between the two. And, And when we have that promised purpose and we embrace it, we escape the direction that our own purposes will take us, which is invariably towards death. Where when we embrace the purpose of God, it invariably leads to life. So I'd say the capstone way of looking at it is this. The ultimate purpose that we can embrace is living a Jesus-centered life. And that should be something that sounds fairly familiar if you've been connected to our church, because we've said the very reason we exist as a church, our purpose is to help people live Jesus-centered lives. Jesus at the core of who we are. And as a result, with Jesus at the core, that will affect every other area of our life. It impacts us emotionally, intellectually, physically, spiritually. All areas of our lives are impacted when Jesus is at the center. 
And so we want to help people to live lives that are centered on Jesus. But to do that, I think there's a very good filter for us to, to think about. I've already shared with you what's often called the Great Commission in Scripture. That's where Jesus is ascending to the Father at the end of his earthly ministry, and he says, hey, go make disciples. You know, he's given us, this is what you need to go about being. But he also has something in Scripture, also in the book of Matthew in chapter 22, called the Greatest Commandment. Not just the Great Commission, but the Great Commandment. And let me read that for you here. This is Matthew 22, starting in verse 37. You, and he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Here was his answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all, not part, with all, your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The, most, the thing we're supposed to be about, just like King Solomon said, right? Fear God and keep his commands. The most important thing that we can be about as in the entirety of our humanity is loving God. But it's a very interesting construction. It says, the, and the second is like it. And in essence, what he's saying is the way you do the first is by accomplishing the second. Okay? And what's the second? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, love God, love your neighbor, depend all the law and the prophets. The entirety of the, the Hebrew Bible what we call our Old Testament in our Bibles. All of it, everything that was pointing to Jesus was summed up by loving God and loving others. Very broad categories, but I think very, very informative. Because if we can create filters for our lives based on this, it's going to massively impact our lives. So, living out a Jesus purposed, which is really what a Jesus-centered life is, a Jesus purposed life requires two things. You cannot live a Jesus-purposed or a Jesus-centered life without these two things. First of all, love God with everything you have. And can you guess what the second one is? Love others with everything you have. This might seem like I'm uh, overly simplifying it. But I think this is very, very good for us because it creates a filter. If I'm doing something that doesn't check the box of loving God or loving others, if it violates either of those, this is not part of God's purpose for your life. If you doing something for you, which is not intrinsically bad, requires you to do something that's unloving to someone else, it's not the right thing. It must be able to check the box of loving God and loving others. And quite frankly, the most profound way, the most readily accessible way that we actually fulfill the greatest commandment of loving God is by loving others, doing things for the good of others, bringing justice about in the lives of others, showing mercy in the lives of others, extending grace to the lives of others. So often we say, what can I get for me? That's the world I live in, right? What can I get for number one? But the Bible says, no, be concerned about everyone else because if we, especially as a church community, if we are focused on loving everyone around us well, guess who's left out? No one. So, so whereas the world says, care about yourself because you might be left out, we're saying, no, no, everyone is caring about everyone else. So if you're a group of 20, you don't have one person looking out for one. You have 19 other people looking out for you rather than just one. It is a beautiful picture of what it means to, to be the community, to have the fellowship, to live out that quality of eternal life when you're in a community that loves one another, sees their purpose for what it is in God, and does it in their community, who lives out that righteousness of Jesus amongst one another. Everyone's needs are met. Everyone is cared for. And that's what we're being, being invited to be part of. That's the purpose that we've been given to love one another well, and in so doing, loving God with everything we have. What we're going to do now, we're going to sing a song that talks about our relationship that is offered to us in Jesus, that we can look to God in heaven and call him Father. We can even say he's our good, good Father.